wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not, and she shall preserve you, love her, and she shall keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding. Proverbs 4, verses 5 through 7. Everybody, welcome to the Get Understanding podcast, the Christian podcast that explores the combination of faith and everyday life. I'm your host, Kainisa Martin, and each week we dive deep into the scriptures and discuss how they apply to our lives and how they are to be applied. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Get Understanding podcast. It is your host once again, Kainisa Martin. And I just hope everyone's having or getting started with a great t- a great day today um, and that you guys prepared um, yourself for this day in regards to just being proactive and planning out your day a little bit beforehand so that way the day doesn't get ahead of you. So today the um, I had not really um thought about well I thought about honestly a couple of titles for this episode but when I woke up a couple of days ago um I just heard get thee behind me Satan so from that point you know I was like well Lord what are you saying and so um I just went to, you know, scripture where that phrase was spoken by Jesus and read from there. And here is the culmination of that um, Bible study. So the title of the podcast episode is Get Thee Behind Me, Satan. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at or focusing on um a nature or characteristics along with the um actual person um so we're going to be reading from Matthew as well as we're going to be reading from Matthew um the book of Genesis as well as Mark and Luke. And, um, you know, and we're going to go from there. But again, get thee behind me, Satan. So we have to be mindful that Satan is, um, you know, the fallen angel, the fallen cherub angel who was anointed of God. Before the fall, his name given was Lucifer. And um, so a lot of times, I think I spoke on it, spoke on it before, um, throughout the week before, you know, uh, throughout the week before I record, or even just the Lord, you know, leading me on a path of understanding a specific thing, teaching me a specific thing. Um, there'll be occurrences, you know, in my day-to-day life and even things that I've studied in the Bible um, over the course of the days or over the course of the week. I was listening to a message by Pastor Charles, Charles Lawson, and it was a series of messages called, um, i trying to remember called let me see if I can find it because I do not want to misquote it um but in that message it was speaking about so th- this specific episode in the series or this specific message in the series was speaking about um the progression or revealing of who Satan is and um is done so to enable us to see beyond, you know, 
the five carnal senses and looking at what people do um, or, or what people say, what people profess out of their mouth. The Bible does instruct us to know them by their fruit and to also know those who labor amongst us. But how do or how can we know these things? How can we know someone who labors amongst us? How can we examine fruit? How can we know individuals by their fruit? Um, let me see. I'm almost down there. Okay, so the name of the series is Making Connections. Now, the specific episode that I'm referring to um, as far as listening to in my foundation of what you know i'm going to be speaking of now progress from it's making connections part four satan's gradual fall so again in that episode it pretty much speaks about um satan satan's nature um and this is again this is my understanding of what's what i've been taught satan's nature and then the revealing of the character or the person that has been described through a nature through fruit We all know that in order, well, I don't know if we all know, but in order to identify a tree, you must examine fruit. Obviously, for example, a lot of people use as a fruit tree. And then getting even branching from that, um, let's talk about an apple tree. We know that there are many different kinds of apples and we can say, hey, I've planted an apple tree, but what kind of apple tree did you plant? And unless you are well versed and um, you study plant life, you will not know that tree until it bears fruit. But until it begins to bear, well, honestly, um, in the process process of it bearing fruit, because we know that apples just don't pop on a tree as a big old apple. There is a culmination, a culmination, a maturing, a process of that fruit tree from seed to um, the producing of that fruit and to the culmination or the final end of that fruit. At that point, we can realize, okay, it's a Granny Smith apple or it's a um, whatever kind of apple. So we get into, in this episode, we're going to start off again with Matthew and we're going to specifically turn to Matthew chapter 16. Um, we're going to look at verse 21. And initially I was like, okay, how did I get from here? Once I got done with my um, Bible study, again, starting off with Matthew, any account where Jesus um, stated, get thee behind me, Satan. Once I was done, I was like, okay, I saw the front, the, you know, the beginning point, but how in the world did I get over here? That's That's the importance of being led and taught by the Holy Spirit because he puts the Bible together. He knows what he's doing. And all scripture was inspired by God. And this is the difference between dead letter and um, the spirit of God revelating the Bible. All right. So we're going to start at verse 16. And I am reading from the King James Version. We're going to go from 21 down to verse 28. And it reads, And Simon Peter answered and said, I'm sorry, that's 16. I got to go down a little bit further. And in verse 21, it reads, from the time, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now, mind you, this is the same Peter that said, you're the son of God. And Jesus confirmed what was stated about him by saying, flesh and blood didn't tell you this, but my father from heaven, Jesus Christ can only be revealed by God, the father. Um, And that's, that's going to be important to understand as we progress into the episode. So God, the father, who is a spirit revealed Jesus Christ in Peter, because it wasn't a matter of laying eyes on Jesus and knowing he's the son of God, because, you know, they had been with Jesus but it wasn't until God revealed Jesus Christ as the Messiah that he understood. And even we see that during some of the interactions with Jesus, people questioned and wondered, you know, who who is this? Who could do such great things? Um, you know, commanding the sea and they obey. And in verse 22, it says, um, 
I'm sorry, going back to verse um, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, again, this discourse, this is going to be important to understanding where we're going in the podcast. So keep this in your mind. Then verse 24, it reads, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life. And going back when he says whosoever will save his life, meaning his terrestrial life, his life here on earth, this temporary life. Whoever will save this temporary life will lose it, meaning that they'll lose eternal life. And whosoever will lose his terrestrial life, giving his life to Christ for my sake and um, shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So if you gaining, if you're gaining something for something that that's indicative of an exchange or a proposal of a deal, what is a man profited? So what would a man gain? What would a man benefit if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So what will you gain um, really from, um, from receiving the whole world at the expense of your own soul? Or, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. So as I was as I was reading this, um, progressing throughout the you know my study time, I thought about you know what will a man offer you for your soul? What is in you that the devil can identify to say, okay, you don't want to be rejected. You want to be wealthy. You want a name for yourself. You want authority. So what can I offer what can I offer you that will seemingly look as if you will receive those things so that way you give me your soul? In the um in reference to John I'm not John the Baptist, but in reference to Judas, he was a thief. He loved money. The love of money is the root of all evil. You, anything that you know you would People make money a god and an idol. So in order to receive money, Judas offered up his soul. And with these are the things we have to realize that as we interact, um, when we see um, where we're given things, where we're offered things, and it can seemingly look good, always look to see is what I'm about to receive and come into agreement with going to be a hindrance to my walk with the Lord. And then it's also about the the person that's giving the quote unquote gift as well. Because when Satan gives something that looks like a gift, it's really a curse. In verse 27, it says, on on another example, um, when um, the account with um, Abram going to battle to receive back Lot and the rest of the family, the king of Sodom came out and says, you know, give me the souls and keep the stuff. That's that. This is a deal being made. So it doesn't say that it's saying, but it, it describes him as a man, um, the king of Sodom. And we're going to get into the descriptions as well, especially in these accounts. So Satan tried to offer Abraham saying, hey, all this stuff, because in war, you receive the spoils. So he said, hey, I'll let you keep all this stuff. Just give me the souls. So he's saying, you can keep all this material possessions, but give me the people. I want their souls. And Abraham said, no. Unless you say that you've made 
Abram rich. <clears throat> Excuse me. But at 20, verse 27, it reads, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. So not in the glory of the world. And this is going to be important as well when we look at to see, okay, well, why is Jesus saying certain things in particular instances? So Jesus says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So that right there, it didn't say that the person won't die. It just said that they won't taste death until this particular instance takes place. Okay, so we just read why Jesus speaking to Peter, but addressing Satan. So this is Jesus knowing the heart of man, knowing what's in man. Because again, in the Bible it says that Jesus need, didn't need for anyone to testify of man because he knew what was in man. So Jesus um, directing this statement towards Peter, but speaking to Satan. Because um, I'm going to say this. And we'll see it as we progress in the episode. In our in fallen nature, man without God, if we have not been born again, we are soulish creatures. Meaning that our soul, which is our mind and emotions, um, our soul, well, the soul part of us, we know that we are a triune being, a spirit, soul, and a physical body. The soul of man is the programmable part of man. The soul is the receiver. So if the soul consists of our mind, will, and emotions, without God, who is a spirit, another spirit will seek to govern our souls, to inspire or influence our mind, will, and emotions. Again, the soul is the programmable part of us. It is the receiving part of us. It's, a, it's strictly a receiver. Without God, when we have not been born again, our flesh in covenant with the devil does the will of unclean spirits. We know Satan is an unclean spirit and it require our souls require a spirit to give it an identity and to give it instructions. So we know um, that if you have, um, you know, a remote control car, for instance, like I said, with a remote control car, you have the actual car, you have the remote control, and you have the controller. In order for that remote control car to move, it takes a controller to take the remote to give the room to um, give the remote instructions through moving, you know, um, or toggling through the joystick. It would take it takes a controller to apprehend or take the remote to input instructions saying whether it's going left, going right, going straight, speed up, slow down. So that way, once the controller received those instructions or once the remote received those instructions from the controller, the car will move. This is um, a practical example of how the spirit, soul, and body operate. Now, with that being said, Fallen man without the spirit of God leading and guiding our spirit instruct when our spirit instructing our soul and our body obeying coming to a complete agreement. Our souls are at the um, will of an unclean spirit of another spirit because again the soul requires a spirit for instructions. It will the soul will will sit dormant do nothing. And the body will sit there, be dormant, do nothing without the inspiration of a spirit. Now, we're going to go ahead and turn to, we're going to stay in Matthew, but we're going to go to chapter four. So again, a spirit gives our souls 
its identity. Okay, so keep that in mind as well. So we're going to Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to read um, verses 1 through 11. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, um, I want to go ahead and give, you know, the definition of devil. So we see devil here as lowercase. So um, again, when we're reading the Bible, we want to pay attention to punctuation, how things are said, and even going back into an interlinear Bible where we're reading the um, scripture and the language that it was written in to see, okay, is this really lowercase? Should it be uppercase? Was there an S um, in the original language that's not on the in the English language, this, these things make a big difference to our understanding of what the Lord is saying. <clears throat> so devil is, uh, so in your concordance, devil in the Hebrew side of your concordance, the number is 100, I'm sorry, 1,222. And the word is diablos, diabolos. It is, devil is defined as slanderous, accusing falsely, the word devil is an adjective. Adjectives describe nouns. So Satan is described as a devil, which is a slanderer and accuser. So now we're seeing the characteristics or the fruit of Satan. And this is extremely important as we go about in our day-to-day -day lives to know and to be able to, help, to identify fruit in every environment whether they claim to be Christian or not, we have to be able to identify fruit. Is this fruit? Is this, um, is what they're saying, doing what they're displaying? Is it slanderous? Is it, am I being accused falsely? If so, you're in the presence of a devil, Satan. It could be Satan himself or it can be, you know, demons. It could be fallen angels. But, if they're, if they're slanderous and accusing falsely, you have a devil. So going back to the scripture in um, verse one, it says, Then Jesus was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, the accuser, the slanderer. We have to be, because um, we're going to turn back there in a little while. But if we know that in this occurrence that we're going to be reading that Jesus was being tempted, so in these temptings, if devil means to be slanderous and accused falsely, then whom is really being um, slandered and accused of um, in this in this discourse? We know that in the book of Genesis that God the Father was accused falsely by the serpent, who is saying this is another characteristic, another nature, another fruit of Satan. My, because when Satan says something, he doesn't directly tell you what he's saying or doing if, you know, you're not just all in with him. He said, in the day that you eat thereof, the Lord doth know that you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So what the devil just accused God of is being a liar. Is being, um, you know, just selfish, keeping something from you. So he's falsely accusing God the Father. So just because you're not directly being accused of or slandered, when someone comes to you with gossip, talking about something based from their feelings because they feel offended, they could be slandering the very person that the Lord wants you to minister to, the Lord wants you to walk with, examine fruit. And especially if you don't know the people that's being slandered because that will manipulate how you see them. So reading on, it says, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter, so we see whoever Jesus is being tempted, well, we see that Jesus is being tempted of the devil, who is a slanderer and an accuser. It's, and then it says, when the tempter came, so the devil and the tempter, these are the same people. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 
Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. So we see there's um, a exchange between using the word devil and tempter. So these are the same people. You have to get in our mind that these are the same people. And then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. So if this, if the devil can bring a, bring a person to another location and bring them on a, a temple, what, what's being, what is Jesus interacting with? Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down for it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. This here is a vivid description of dead letter. And what do I mean by dead letter? Dead letters meaning that a dead spirit, an unclean spirit, reading from the Bible, perverting it. This is how you get denominations. This is how you this is how you get people that have founded these denominations, these divisions, these outskirts from the word of God where the people, you know, whether they don't agree with something, whether they're practicing practicing something, they're perverting the gospel, they have not been born again. They will read dead letter meaning that the Holy Spirit is not revelating to them the word of God. They will take dead letter and create a denomination. They will take dead letter and weaponize it against you because Satan knowing that, okay, hey, you 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 know the word, you read your Bible. So I'm going to trick you into obeying me through the word of God. And you would think that, well, the devil doesn't know the Bible. He wouldn't use the Bible. Y yes, he would. Because he know the letter without the spirit is dead. Period. He, he knows this. This is why he will use it to have you sit there in a denominational church where the spirit of God is not there, where there is no deliverance, where they're talking about now, where now they're importing the world blatantly into um, religion. Well, the word is already in religion, but where they can blatantly make allowances for um the devil's laws in a quote unquote church. So what, what was once with an outward showing looked Christian, it looked good. It looked holy. Now they're importing everything that the world does blatantly into the church. So homosexuals up in there now, um, allowances for sodomy, you know, same sex marriage and, um, allowances for sin at this point now because of dead letter. And you will sit there and come into agreement with it because you know you're a sinner. You know your desires, your appetites, what you do in the dark. And so now if they're allowing outwardly these things to take place, now I'm even more able to indulge in my sins and even build off from it, even degrade even more. Because now I don't have to just look like I'm a Christian now I can do outwardly the things that these sinners do because this church has okayed it. And it's the synagogue of Satan. Now, reading on in verse seven, it reads, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This is why you have to take the whole Bible and not just bits and pieces of it. Because the corner mind will say, oh, well, yeah, the, the Bible does kind of say what you just said. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump off because I believe the word of God. But again, dead letter are are for, for, for dead spirits. So Jesus, knowing the scriptures, knowing the spirit of the scriptures, says to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world. And the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. So this this is why I was saying and when we read from um Matthew sixteen, where Jesus said, um, that what what would a man gain from receiving the whole world? I'm gonna read a, a bit back from it in verse twenty six of 
chapter 16, Jesus said, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then we read on a little further that Jesus said he comes in the glory of his father and with his angels. You know, give rewards out to everyone that they're due. So Jesus in chapter 16 is addressing or um, referring back to Satan offering him the world. But obviously we see that in Satan offering Jesus the world, the kingdoms of this world, the glory of this world. He's not also tell them it's at the expense of your soul. He says, fall down and worship me. He will say something that seems as if it's not bad just to bow down to him. I'm just bowing down. But you can't sit there and say, I'll say, for example, if you're in the midst of a, a group or a sorority or fraternity or whatever, and um, and there's something from you to read from, and you just change one word, you, you are still coming into a covenant. You are still obeying their dictates. And... Now you come under the subjection of whatever spirit that heads that organization. So and so you can't just say, okay, I'll, I'll bow down. But then you say, Lord, I don't really bow down. I really worship you. No, you're bowing down. You don't worship the Lord. And bow it down and worship is indicative of obedience. Now it says in verse 10, then say the Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan. Okay, so again, we see that during... Um, this discourse, Satan is first described as the devil, the tempter. And now that, so these things are characteristics or fruit or nature of Satan, because now Jesus di- um, addresses him directly saying, get thee hence Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou worship. I mean, only him and um, him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So we see that first in this discourse, and I, I especially want to read this from Mark because there was something that I read in there that I also like. Hey, why is this here? So we see in this account in Matthew, Satan was first identified as the devil and the tempter. So again. God knowing that um, the devil can change himself into an angel of light and his ministers, ministers of righteousness. But look at fruit. Look at fruit in comparison to the Bible, not to your opinions, not to what you were grew up, what you um, were taught to believe a Christian was in accordance to the word of God. So now again, we're going to read this account in Mark. All right, so we're going to go to Mark chapter 1. We're going to go to Mark chapter 1. We're going to read verses 12 and 13. And it reads, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, speaking about Jesus, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and angels ministered unto him. Now, read that in Mark. Um, so we see that immediately Mark identifies um, the one that was doing the tempting as Satan. He doesn't go from devil to tempter. He just says, blankly, it is Satan tempting him. And the point that I was um, making as far as in he was in he was with the wild beasts. So I began to just to ask a question because. A lot of times when I'm reading the Bible and then another scripture comes to mind, I'll ask, well, you know, do these things go together? Is this rightly divided for me to, to, you know, um, draw this conclusion? So for in the book of Mark, for um, it to be identified that, okay, Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. We know that in the other account, he fasted for those 40 days and he was tempted of Satan. and we know now that there was wild beasts in the wilderness. So I began to question, okay, so was it a beast that came and tempted Jesus? You know, it could have been a deer, maybe a serpent again, or whatever the case. Because um, we see, we're going to look at um, Genesis, the book of Genesis. We're going to go to the book of Genesis, um, chapter three. 
So I began to be like, okay, well, was it a beast that um, tempted Jesus? And you were like, well, animals don't talk. We see that, you know, in the Old Testament that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, it may have been uh, Balak that was riding on a donkey and a donkey opened up his mouth and, and began to speak. So Genesis chapter three, you're going to read verse one. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So we see a beast. It literally says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So we see here that we have to look at characteristics, we look at natures, we look at fruit. So the individual identified here is the serpent, who is which is a beast, tempting Eve. So the same tempting we see in Genesis is the same tempter we see in Matthew and also recorded in, in Mark and Luke. So we're going to look at a nature. Okay, the serpent, also identified as a beast of the field, or uh, in Matthew account, a beast in the wilderness. So I'm going, oh, okay, well, was it a beast that came and, you know, tempted the Lord? Or even, obviously, the nature of Satan being a beast, being a serpent. So we're seeing characteristic traits of Satan. We're seeing the nature of Satan. We're seeing the fruit of Saint, Satan being a tempter, being an, a false accuser. So here, this serpent, this beast is falsely accusing God. Now, um, if the devil cannot use you, he will try to kill you. And when he's done using you, he'll he'll kill you. So in him trying to kill you because you're not obeying, you're being resistant, a lot of time he comes through suicide, whether it's um, through you actually, you know, taking a, a gun, a knife or whatever the case. And even to you, you know, drinking yourself to death, um, things that were, it looks like you didn't intentionally try to kill yourself, but the devil was working towards you do, having an overdose and, um, so the devil will try to manipulate you because, again, in, in your fallen state, the spirit of God is not governing governing you and instructing you and inspiring you. So your soul seeks for another spirit to, um, to, to be able to instruct it on what to do, what to think, you know, its desires, its appetites, and then the body carries it out. Um, whatever spirit we yield our members to becomes our master. It becomes the masters of our soul. And um, so one other things that I was that I was looking at that um, the Lord just began to show me. So I believe I stated in this episode that man is triune being um, in reflection of being created by a triune God. So God created man in his image and likeness. So his image and, you know, um, and what he looks like and then likeness, character and fruit. Now, again, God being a triune God, God, the father, God, the son and God, the Holy Spirit. They are united. They are one. They are in total agreement. There's no schisms. There's no divisions. There's no arguing. There's no disagreements. None of that. God the Father wills it um, or thinks it or conceptualizes it. These, this, this is an abstract of spirit. It says in the Bible that God is a spirit. and He requires that we worship him in spirit and in truth. So, so God the Father... Um, wills it again um this is an obviously an abstract and conceptual or concepts are abstract meaning that they exist in the mind they're not tangible until they are expressed and this is one thing i was speaking to a young lady about um 
concepts and, and being abstract and numbers, you know, a representation of a three, a numerical three is not three, but it, it's the express image of the concept of three. So we ask, okay, where do concepts come from? Concepts are abstracts. So they existed before us and without us, then, um, like numbers and math, they have to be sovereign, meaning that they were created by a sovereign God, God the Father, the triune um, God. So, and then we see that God the Son, he receives instructions or obeys the Father. This would be like our soul because our soul obeys a spirit. So God the Son, Jesus Christ coming um in flesh and blood, in flesh and blood, living as a man, and even in heaven, he obeys of the Father. He receives instructions from the Father, and then God the Holy Spirit goes into action to perform um, obeying the Son and the Father. This will be indicative of the body, you know, our our physical body, which obeys the soul that is inspired by the Spirit. And looking at this, I was just like. Lord, you're amazing because these things are indicative of the fact that nothing was random. Everything was predestined. Everything has a plan and a purpose that has been created by God. And all of these things bear witness to the fact that God created man in the world. You know, the universe, the planets and, and things of that nature. God created it because his handprint is on it. It's, it, it's amazing. So I'm going to say that again. God the Father wills it. He He thinks of it, um, conceptualizes it. It, it exists. It starts with him first. It starts with God the Father first, who is a spirit. And we're, um, we're making that bridge across of body, soul, and spirit, how they operate. So first, the will comes from the Father, which will be our spirit, our spirit um, receiving from the Father of spirits. God the Son receive instructions. This would be indicative of our souls obeying a spirit or obeying God the Father if we're born again, obeying the Holy Spirit if we're born again. And if you haven't been born again, you're obeying unclean spirits, demons, Satan. You're, you're obeying unclean spirits because you don't have a head over your soul um, as far as um, a Holy Spirit. And then God the Holy Spirit goes into action to perform or obey um, the Son and the Father. This is indicative of our body, which obeys the soul that received and was inspired by a spirit. So plainly, an example would be, um, and I'm going to wrap it up in a little bit, but an example would be if, okay, in my mind, I think I'm hungry. I say, okay, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat. And at that point, I can either have, um, a salad or I can have a um, barbecue. So we received, or I'm not going to, I'm not even going to do that example. That example is too um, moderate because we, to do that, we don't have to be inspired by God to say, you know, eat or I'm hungry. So for, for example, um, fornication, well, things that I know I did in the world. If I say, well, if I don't say, but if I, um, Think in my mind or hear in my mind, um, I want to have sex with so and so. So it, it was a, it's a concept first, meaning that it's a thought that exists in the mind, but the express, you know, and then in my soul, my soul receives that instruction of go fornicate, go have sex with, you know, whoever this person is. So I receive that instruction in my soul, and then the flesh goes into play in being manipulated by the devil to get me aroused whether it's through touch or whatever the case may be because again the flesh is in covenant with the devil if you've not been born again and you know you're not receiving deliverance or anything and the devil tries to use the flesh um as a door into the you know, his obedience to him and then I say okay well and then I go into the act of doing it so in that discourse, it went from concept to ex the express, um, the expression of the concept, which would be to actually do the act that was thought of first. So abstracts, obviously, um, 
come from the spirit. You know, it's it's not three dimensional. It's not tangible. So this is how we know. And a lot of scientists are trying to figure out how does the mind work in accordance to in, um, interconnectivity with the brain. All concepts come from the spirit world, meaning that um, come from a spirit. So I remember a while ago I was talking to um, my pastor, Pastor Price, about words. I forgot what the specifics of what about the conversation, but I was saying that how could I represent words being an object? And I gave a complicated answer now that I understand what I understand now. It was a complicated answer. And literally, it just goes from abstract to express to the expression of that um, abstract. So, for instance, like I gave earlier, the expressed image of a of a con- of a concept um, like a number would be a numerical number. So, in order to teach something, God being abstract, God not being um, interspersed in His creation, like God is in a tree, God is in a cloud, God being outside of His creation. You know, say, okay, well, I'm an abstract God. I, I'm, I'm a spirit, but these people are going to f- stray so far away from me that they will not be able to relate to me. So, how can I teach them um, my ways? How can I teach them how to operate and be citizens in the kingdom of God? Because the kingdom of God, everything e- eternal, is abstract. It's it's abstract. So, how can I teach them? So at that point, as the creator, you go into play with making expressed image of these eternal things. We know that the expressed image of the triune God, um, one is the family unit, a father, a mother, and a child. And then even drilling down even deeper, a person, body, soul, and spirit in Everything is that God created is literally interwoven or not interwoven, but created to give God glory and see his mind in it. Because, again, we're taking um, things that were created by the by God from his mind. And so obviously anything that is touched by him will reflect him. Now, the soul is like a blank canvas, um, a blank canvas awaiting the painter to give it its own identity through what is painted on it. Only a spirit can give an identity. And Jesus Christ, um, Jesus Christ is the Godhead bodily. So with a spirit giving identity, because again, the soul is just a receiver, that means it needs um, something to program the soul, to give its identity. So in the world, when I didn't know God, I just pretty much just searched around for an identity and the devil knows that our, our true identity that will give us a rest and have us stop searching comes from God. But being that Satan cannot feel God's shoes in man, he just throws out a bunch of different inputs, a bunch of different options. Um, with a multitude of spirits, there comes a multitude of identities but in Christ, there is one identity, a child of God. You still have you know, your own likes and dislikes, but at the root of us, we're children of God and we are anchored in that. So when different things in the world occur you know, from different celebrities, different hairstyles, different fashions or whatever, we're not prone to just yield to all these things because we have an identity. We know what we like, we know what we don't like, and we're settled in that. But in sin, you know... Whatever new celebrity came, I remember like when Nicki Minaj first came out, I went out and bought um, platinum blonde wigs or platinum blonde hair, had platinum blonde hair, bright pink lipstick, looked absolutely crazy. But because I didn't have an identity, whatever was put in front of me, I tried to emulate it and I allowed it to imprint on my soul to where I tried to be like them because I did not have an identity. But in Christ... When we're a new creation, we receive our identity from God the Father. We receive our identity from Jesus Christ. And the Lord begins to deliver us and sanctify our souls so so that way we can become his expressed image. And we become his expressed image through obedience to the word, through reading our Bible, through studying the Bible, through fasting, through prayer, through listening to praise and worship. 
And everything that was programmed into our soul is being washed out of us. This is sanctification unto holiness. This is um, the reason why deliverance is needed because our souls are the programmable part of us. And if we have been in the soul for any amount of years, we have onboarded wrong programming, whether it's in how we deal with people, whether it's in how we handle our money, whether it's in how we treat our bodies, we have received wrong programming. And it takes the word of God being submitted to it, yielded to it, obeying it. They were able to become, and our souls can reflect and use our bodies to be the expressed image of Jesus Christ, to be the expressed image of what God intended for us to be. Our spirit and a spirit and a soul must agree in order for the body to go into operation. Um, I wrote down the spirit and soul must agree. The body is only at the will of the inspired soul who inspires the soul can vary. So again, a demon can inspire our soul to do evil and then our bodies carry it out. Or we can be inspired by the Holy Ghost and our soul obeys the promptings of the spirit and our body goes into action to do whatever we were instructed to do, to lay hands on somebody because as, as the spirit wills, again, the Holy Spirit, as the spirit wills, our souls come into agreement into what the Lord just told us to do. And then the body carries it out. In this three dimensional world, the body is necessary as a vehicle to do what's necessary. And then there was, um, and so just reiterating, because once I got done, I'm like, well, how did I, I'm sorry, excuse me. Well, how did I get from, you know, get the behind me Satan to the operation of the body, soul, and spirit? The Lord intentionally, the Holy Spirit intentionally giving characteristic traits and using Satan as well. So that way we can see his nature. We can see the fruit of this spirit because it's, again, it's a spirit. So in dealing with people, identifying a nature, identifying characteristic traits, is this characteristic of God or is this characteristic of Satan? It's important to know that, especially in these last days, because, again, the Bible tells us that Satan can turn himself into an angel of light. So he can look good. He can sound good. He can seem as though he's bringing peace and all of these things. But the end is death. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve you. Love her, and she shall keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding. Proverbs 4, verses 5-7